Before I introduce Judy, uh, I'd like to do this morning's reading because I found one that I think dovetails nicely with her talk and it's, it's titled Sex and Spirit by the Reverend Robin Tanner, who is a UU minister. She's also a poet and a, and a real activist, uh, especially for LGBTQ rights, uh, for health care as a human right, for voting rights. Uh, and she's a, a minister at the Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, so she writes, Desire and sexuality are not held in high regard by many of the world's religious traditions. And sex, don't even go there. As extremism arises, desires are seen as objects of suppression while bodies become things to control. The Greeks first articulated this idea of separation of the spirit and body. Uh, drawing upon Greek philosophy, today's religious fundamentalism fuses disembodied theology with purist politics. Let's be clear, at the core of this body and spirit separation is a deeper distrust of humanity. It wasn't always this way. Many of the world's religions have strong mystical traditions with beautiful imagery, poetry, and teachings about the holy erotic. The word desire comes from the Latin desire, or from the stars. We believe its etymology traces to a common phrase in the early 13th century. If someone was seeking direction in their life or guidance, they might be instructed to await what the stars will bring, or follow their desire. Those offering this advice couldn't have known that all life on this planet, including all humans, are at least at the atomic level, stardust. In some sense, then our desires are not base or less than the spiritual, and certainly not separate, but rather of the celestial. If we long to develop the depths of our spirituality, then we also must embrace and understand the depths of our sexuality. I think that fits very nicely with what Judy's going to say. And now I will have a technological, I'm going to have a pause for a technological feat of magic. If any of you believe in prayer, now would be the time. A UU miracle. So, so um, Judy Barnett, she joined our fellowship in 2017. Is that correct? It seems like you've been here all along. Uh, she's a healthcare professional who has worked as a nurse in intensive care and emergency medicine before becoming a certified nurse anesthetist. She's worked in, I think, most or all of the hospitals in Columbus. And she's also a certified yoga instructor. Uh, please join me in welcoming Judy Barnett. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so one of the things that I realized when I joined this fellowship, I love the subject matter that we have on Sundays, the speakers. Some of my friends asked me, do you have preaching? And I said, no, it's like a TED talk every week. We have different talks, art, music, science, religion, but that's what I like about this. So I, I told Bill I would like to do a talk and it's something I'm sort of passionate about. Um, I'm approaching this subject today from the perspective 
of a woman, a wife, a mother, a grandmother to five girls, a nurse, a feminist, and an activist. I've been talking a lot about this subject with my daughter. She's a urogynecologist in Atlanta, and I've talked with my teen granddaughters, and I've done a lot of research to find out the current state of sex ed in Muskogee County. So we're going to start, hopefully, by looking at how this subject relates to our seven principles. Um, when I was looking for a slide to use, I found a children's version, and I thought we're talking about youth. We'll use this version, which I like. They're just simple, same concept, but different versions. And I think our subject today relates to the first principle, because every person is important, and we need to teach positive affirmations to every student that we work with about their sexuality. Second of all, um, the second principle be kind in all you do. We need to show compassion when dealing with differences in sexual orientation, gender identity, and social and cultural norms. And then I think we use the fourth one, especially by searching for truth in the subjects we're teaching. So um, the reason I got involved with this subject was an online newsletter that I received. And the newsletter was called, Teens Don't Always Get Their Sex Ed at School. TikTokers are stepping in. This platform is filling an educational gap, but like everything else, it has its limitations. So um, this is sort of an aside. This is called The Lily, and The Lily was originally a newspa newspaper published by Amelia Bloomer in 1849. It was for and about women. And Ms. Bloomer was not a quiet person. You'll notice it shut down after four years because she was advocating to end slavery, the right to vote, the right to own property, and the right to wear pants. And so she didn't last too long, but she published and did everything with this newspaper. So Washington Post now has a newsletter um, they started in 2017, you can subscribe to it, and it's in her honor. So this is a great newsletter for women. So teenagers are using social media to get most of their information. Some use Facebook, that's sort of become an old person's platform now. The teenagers, once the adults get into it, they move to the next media. Um, some use Instagram, but TikTok is the latest thing that the teenagers use for communicating. TikTok is a video sharing social network. It's owned by a Chinese company, and you can use it to make short videos, 15 seconds to three minutes long. So curious teenagers struggle to find answers to questions about their bodies. And they try to find it online, but as we know, a lot of times this information is not accurate, and anybody can put a video up on TikTok. Many t teenagers are porn educated, and that sentence just makes me sick and crazy. But teenagers are looking at porn to try to understand what sex is like. Some middle children have made a game, middle school children, have made a game of watching porn at boy-girl parties and trying to mimic the behavior. And this is something that came from my daughter. She heard this in her practice when she had young women come in and say that was where they learned most about sex. Some educators pediatricians, OBGYNs, and therapists are beginning 
to start to influence this by sharing videos. They are addressing viewer concerns and answering their questions. Mostly, teenagers want to know if their bodies and emotions are normal. A teen might say, I never ask this to someone I know, but I'll ask it to the stranger. Virginity, masturbation, and other subjects are answered by the host. M many videos have up to two million likes. In one video, an educator walks you through the steps of taking an STD test while taking one herself on camera to try to destigmatize the process. So most of the information that young adults are receiving comes from their peers, from social media, and from sexually explicit content on the internet. Age eight is the average age of first exposure to porn. And that's because every six to eight to 10 year old has a cell phone. They're curious. Their older friends talk to them. So we're going to change the subject just a bit and look at the history of sex education. So the first school sex ed was taught in Chicago school systems in 1913. There was some resistance from the Catholic Church, and he, the superintendent was fired shortly after this. But then after World War I, syphilis and gonorrhea became a public health issue, and that brought instruction back into the schools. So by 1920, about 30% of the schools taught some kind of sex ed. In 1950, the American Medical Association developed a sex ed series to try to standardize sex education in the schools. So there was some pushback in the 60s and the 70s. The sexual revolution came about, and it was challenged by the religious conservatives. They thought sex ed would lead to immoral lifestyles. But then again, another epidemic changed the way things were taught. In the 80s, AIDS and HIV changed everything again. So schools again started to try to teach protection from sexual, sexually transmitted diseases. By the year 2000, health education had dropped down to 22 states which mandated mostly abstinence-based sex ed. Well, this works half the time. Okay. Uh, so now the state of sex education. There's no universal um, standardized mandate. Less than half the states require that sex ed be taught. President Obama shifted away from abstinence programs when he was president toward more comprehensive. But then Trump undid that, and he allocated $75 million for abstinence-only education. So there is no dedicated federal funding for teaching. This is despite the fact that polls found 89% of parents support middle school sex ed, and 98% of high school parents support sex ed. There are three types of uh, curriculum that are used in this country, or probably everywhere, for sex education. Um, abstinence, abstinence plus, and comprehensive. The first two are sometimes called sexual risk avoidance programs. They teach that abstinence is the only morally sound trajectory for teenagers. The PLUS program also teaches the use of condoms for disease prevention. Comprehensive sex ed teaches that sexuality is a normal and healthy part in human life. This equips students to make their own decisions about 
sex from an informed perspective without invoking shame. It includes contraception, discusses sexual orientation, gender identity, relationships, and consent. There's an organization called Sexuality Information and Educational Council of the U.S., and a survey in 2020 showed most states still stressed abstinence teaching. 30 states now mandate teaching. Only 22 of those require medical accuracy. Now that just blows my mind that you can teach sex education without requiring them to be sex, uh, medically accurate. Fewer teens today are receiving sex ed in school than 14 years ago. Only one state requires instruction on consent, and seven states require that LGBTQ be portrayed, portrayed negatively. Georgia law really only has two requirements. They have to teach sex ed and AIDS prevention, and it must emphasize abstinence and healthy relationships. The good thing is that local school boards in Georgia are responsible for any further curriculum requirements. So that's a good thing. We have some local control. So a closer look at Georgia and Alabama, I just pull these two states because it's so close. States where education must be medically accurate, neither Georgia or Alabama requires that. States where you must cover contraception, not Georgia. States where education must stress abstinence, both Georgia and Alabama. States where education must be inclusive of sexual orientation, not Georgia and Alabama. And states where education must be negative towards sex orientation, Alabama. So we, we're topping almost all of those, and that's not a good thing. So, so this is where the church comes in, in the church versus TikTok. When, if you remember my saying that talking to my daughter had inspired me to research this more, she is in South Atlanta, and she realized the high school her daughters attended used, it, used a crisis pregnancy center to teach their curriculum. These, these groups were bought, brought in by the school system. A crisis pregnancy center you can sort of tell by the slide here. They're usually like help for if you're pregnant, need help. Most of those are um, fake abortion clinics. People think maybe they're going to talk with someone about abortion, but instead they're stigmatized. And anyway, a lot of the schools use these um, pregnancy centers to teach their school curriculum. They stigmatize sexually active youth through shame and fear-based messaging. These centers have increasingly received federal funding to deliver abstinence-based instruction. So my daughter held a public meeting, and she just wanted to get some input about the status, what the parents and the kids thought about their sex education. So she held this meeting, she invited teachers and parents, and she was very pleased to see a group of young men, fathers, sitting in the front row. And she thought, how good is this? These daddies are involved in their children's sex education. They are here to help. She soon realized that that group was made up of pastors from local churches who were there to intimidate her, basically. They sat right in the front row. And they were united to keep real scientific information out of the schools. Some sixth graders at the meeting had said they had been asked to sign purity pledges at school during their teaching by this group. And some of the 11-year-olds there said they signed 
those purity pledges because of intimidation and peer pressure. So closer to home, I guess we should be happy we don't have crisis pregnancy centers teaching, but instead we have a 501c3 religious nonprofit. It's a group called Right From The Start, and they are um, contracted with the school system to teach relationship-based sex ed. They've been contracted with Muskogee County since 2009, so nothing's changed since then. They train employees to instruct for 10 hours in both the sixth grade and the ninth grade. And this group has three goals. They want the children to graduate from high school, then get married, and then have sex. So that is basically the whole plan for this group. It's called Right From The Start. And they are, these are worthy goals. Everybody wants this to happen. But their sex education training is not really sex education at all. First of all, I question whether a religious nonprofit should be allowed to participate in a mandated curriculum. So I spoke before the school board two weeks ago, and I did a five-minute version of this talk for them because you can do public input. And when I spoke before the board, I said, would you allow a Jewish or an Islamic group to come and teach part of your school curriculum? Uh, no answer there. And then I said, should we allow or should the superintendent of schools be doing a video on this website commending their teaching? So Dr. Lewis was in the audience. Um, it is, all he says is this group is very helpful to the school. We appreciate what they're doing. And so he spoke up afterwards. Usually you don't get feedback, but he was very defensive. And he said, religion is never mentioned and their message is here to help with the poverty situation in the school system. So I still ask, is this the best way for us to be teaching sex ed in the schools? Eh, you said I might have to go back. OK. So um, ways forward. We need to have a comprehensive curriculum this is not shown to increase sexual activity among the children. It can decrease the uh, pregnancy rate and the STD rate. It needs to be mandated and federally funded. It should be inclusive, science-based, and medically accurate, taught by licensed teachers or healthcare providers, and not volunteers who are trained by a, a Christian religious organization. The U.S. has the highest rate of teen pregnancy in every developed nation. So in 2020, there was a House bill um, introduced, Georgia Hi House Bill 195, and it required sex ed to be medically correct. That bill died in committee, so hopefully it'll come back. But There are several ways that we can work for change in this um, process. First, we have to um, identify topics that are left out, which is many, since we're just teaching abstinence. We have to demand that it be evidence-based and medically accurate. You can do this by contacting your school board members. There are eight members on the school board. You can call the superintendent and ask for change. You can call your Georgia senators and representatives about the need to increase funding and advance requirements. You can volunteer to be on the School Health Advisory Committee. Um, when I was talking with the school board about this, one of the helpers said, oh, you'd be good to be on the committee which advises. And I have called and tried to get on that committee. I haven't gotten any calls back. I'm not sure 
they want someone as vocal as me, but we'll see. I'll keep working. We can discuss it with our teacher friends and guidance counselors in the schools. They do a lot of work behind the scene because so much is missing. A lot of kids will come to their teachers for advice or for help. And the last thing we can do is to actually vote. These local elections are important. We just had a local election for District 2 here in Muskogee County. I didn't realize this election was even here until a week or so before, and I saw some signs. I tried to research the two candidates. Neither one was a very good candidate. Not one of them had a platform that I could tell. Both were pretty conservative. One was an older white man. The other was a young woman who apparently had um, experience in some private religious schools. But to end on a positive note, I would say the school boards do have some local control, so we can speak up and hopefully get some changes made. I added something I just read about this. Um, the best description of a good sex ed education there's two, two goals, to help people get positive outcomes and to avoid negative outcomes. And in the positive sign, you help people improve their self-esteem, you teach them respect for themselves and others, and you reward non-exploitive behavior. And in the negative side, negative outcome would be STDs or HIV, sexual co-exertion, and unintended pregnancies. So we need to focus more on the positive side of this education and less on just being negative and telling, telling the kids what they can't and should not do. So that's it. Um, Afterwards, I guess we'll have some questions, hopefully, and um, thank y'all for letting me talk. Uh, we extinguish the chalice here that it might glow gently in our hearts as we leave this place.